plenty of time for questions, so I'm happy to take them. I did want to do my little spiel on core story, which is, I think, one of the most important things an author or an aspiring author or at any level of their business um, can, can understand is their own core story. And this is for a very practical reason, which, which is that when you hit a wall in this business, which sooner or later you will, because that is the nature of the writing business, knowing your core story will enable you to feel free. You know you can take it elsewhere. That is a gift. Because too often I think we feel trapped by our own worlds that we created. Is that background noise? Can you hear that? You can hear my phone. You can hear the phone in the background. Eh, I could put it even farther away. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so the core story thing is not your world, not your chosen genre, not your not your kinds of characters. It has to do with what compels you to write. What is that? What is it that the voice inside you says, I really want to tell this story? But knowing why you want to tell the story is the core story. That's your secret. That's your secret power. There's a lot of well, very common in this business is, is what we call second book syndrome. And it can strike any time, fourth book, 50th book, 100th book. But it usually strikes early in the career or when you're about to make a change. And it has to do with the fact that, that your core story, you know you've told it before. And so you're afraid that other people will notice. <laughs> but that's not how it works. Don't confuse core story with plot. Core story is all about the emotions you like to work with. It's all about your passion. It's all about the, the conflicts that compel you. And yes, you will explore them again and again and again for your whole career. Don't worry about it. The only thing you have to worry about changing is the plot. <laughs> So don't focus on focus on the emotions that compel you, right? This is why you feel the call to write. If you try to go in another direction, you're dooming yourself because you're going in a direction where you don't have power. Your power is always from the core, whatever compels you to write. And you should be able to express that your core story, you should be able to express it in two, three, four words max. Because you're not trying to describe your plot. You're trying to describe the emotions you want to work with that get you excited as a writer. Um, for example, my core story, I always use a sense of romantic suspense plot. I love that. I grew up on Nancy Drew, so, you know, so I was probably fated to write romantic suspense. But the core of my story is trust. Other people will who think about it will tell you the core of their story is, is redemption. They like stories of redemption. Others will tell you they like stories of, 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 of um, revenge or justice or something uh, fighting, fighting a battle and winning, that kind of, of sense of vengeance or justice is a better word for it. Um, other people have passions of renewal. Um, the thing about that kind of, a, of analysis of your own core story is that when the wall closes, when the door closes on a particular genre, like there was a time right now, it wasn't a good time for writing it had been very hot for paranormal, for example, for a long time, both as paranormal romantic suspense and as paranormal uh, straight up fantasy. There was just a lot of paranormal out there in one form or another, and there still is a fair amount, but it's not a particularly hot time to be going into that market because it faded. 
it didn't fade. That's not the right word. It it plateaued. It reached its level. Okay, and that's what happens with genres. They come and they go, and they ebb and they fade, ebb and they flow. And you will be dealing with that your whole career, no matter what genre you take. Right now, right now they they're calling it psychological suspense, but between you and me, this is just the modern gothic, right? Very hot right now, the modern gothic. And you know it when you see it, and it's great. It's a great story. It's it's also a very old genre that has been re you know reignited and reinvented for this new generation. And and they're calling it psychological suspense, but trust me, there's always a big house. <laughs> um, there's also that unreliable narrator story, which is pretty much um, based solely on the twists. And if you're really good at writing twists, this is a good field for you. But it is, you need to be good at doing it because that's what it relies on. People want the shock value. And there's kind of an arms race going on right now in, in, uh, in that kind of the unreliable narrator to who can shock the reader the most, right? Who can surprise you the most? Um, so I'm staying out of that market. I'm just not that good with the sudden surprises. Um, but in a way, it's kind of a horror story. And that also is an old, old story that kept, comes around again and again. Um, so what I'm trying to say is don't be tied to your plot or the world you're using for that plot because you can take your core story elsewhere. And that is a just a good thing to remember when things get tough, okay? I'm happy to answer more questions on it, but I just wanted to to get that out there because I just think it's important to, um, that writers shouldn't, it, when second book itis strikes or second book syndrome strikes, this is when you remember that you're writing your core story and don't have to write that same plot. Okay, can we go from here? <laughs> I can keep talking indefinitely if you can hear me. Okay. Any questions before I, carry on. I can go on about voice and other things. So so when you talk about moving your core story elsewhere, um, is that what you mean by like when you you were a, you're Amanda Quick, right? So you're also Jane Castle and you're Jane and Prince, correct? So you move your core story from a um, historical romance genre, right? With that Amanda Quick, where they're detective, like, you know, but that historical romance was there as well. Um, and then moved it to that paranormal genre. But your main core story was like the same, which I thought was brilliant. Is that what you mean? <laughs> yep, that's it. Uh, in fact, I can tell you how I discovered this whole thing with the core story. It was, um, a few years, several years back when I was writing, yes, the book of my heart, right, which was, which was, for me, was always science fiction romance or whatever you want to call it, futuristic romance. And this was way back in the 90s when there was no market. But I, you know, I was convinced my readers, I had built up quite a readership in contemporary romantic suspense, and I thought they'd follow me anywhere. Side, side note, they won't follow you anywhere. <laughs> I did. People who didn't like to read science fiction, and that included most people who were reading romantic suspense and contemporary uh, suspense, didn't want to go there. I killed off my Jane Ann Krentz career the first time around. I've killed off more than one career in my time, uh, but the first time I killed off the Jane Ann Krentz career was with those futuristic romances. <laughs> and now I'll go through and uh, sometimes I've been at signings when. Somebody will come through the line and say, oh, I just love those early romantic expenses set in the futuristic world. And I said, where the hell were you when those books came out? <laughs> because you weren't buying them, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, but at the by the time the third book came back, came out and, and was a dud, it takes a while before. In those days, you it took longer to realize you were failing, put it that way, because the, the feedback mechanism wasn't as strong as it is now for sales. Um, so by the time I realized I'd killed off my career and there were no contracts coming from that publisher anymore, I had to sit back 
and figure out how I was going to reinvent myself. And that's when I realized that my core story was separate from the world. I, yes, I had tons of fun writing the futuristic world and the little ant, you know, strange animals and the, and the powers, you know, the psychic phenomenon and all that. It was fun. Um, but underneath it all was my core story, which was always hinged on romantic suspense and two people who are forced to be able to trust each other in order to survive. And that's the basis of the relationship and the basis of their love. It'll be founded on trust, not physical attraction or, you know, hearts and flowers or anything else. Uh, it's two people who recognize that the hero in each other, essentially, that they can trust this other person um, first with their life and then with their heart. So that essentially kind of comes down to a marriage of convenience. Two people have to figure it out because they don't have any options. And the marriage convenience story, I realized, had a natural home already in Regency romance, in um, historical romance. That's a classic story. I just had never written historical romance. I didn't read it because I read contemporary. But I knew enough about the other genres to know that's where that story might find a home. And that's when my Amanda Quick career that's when I invented Amanda Quick. At, after that, I realized what I had done. I, you know, it was, a, it was a very big revelation for me as a writer. And that's when I realized, aha, basically I'm writing a relationship book built on trust that grows into love and people finding other people who are in a sense, their soulmates in that they are equal they admire each other in the same way. They trust each other and they they can understand each other. They're different, but they can make a perfect whole. So that's my story. And that's really how I learned about core story. And that, it was after that I realized, you know, I don't want to write anything else. Maybe someday in the future that'll change. But um, 20 years ago, this was my core story and it's still my core story today. And I don't have a problem with it. It's, it's been very freeing. Authors I know who've gotten into trouble have been the ones who deliberately tried to go down another path that they just couldn't get excited about. They, they were so anxious not to do the same thing they did last time that they went in a direction that they just couldn't generate any inner, any thrill for. And trust me, if you're not thrilled by what you're writing, if you're not excited, frustrated, happy, delighted, if you don't go through all the emotional turmoil in the writing, that you want your reader to go through, they won't go through it either. It just won't work. Um, let's see. Well, that's the basic of core story. I would add that it's probably tied to that very difficult to define concept of author voice. And that's a whole other subject, but author voice is probably strongly associated with core story, but I'm, that's, I won't go down. I'll let you want me to, I won't go into that other category. So any other questions before we? Actually, I've got one. Yeah, I'm John McCarthy. Um, okay, I can't hear it. You were talking about Jane and Krentz's failure as a science fiction uh, <laughs> romance writer. Yeah. As the audience wasn't ready to follow. And then what you were just saying now, Going back at that, uh, I guess there's two possible questions, both of them nasty. Uh, was it because you didn't have the right enthusiasm for it? Or was it, uh, was it was the problem more with the audience? Uh, okay. Let's not prepare them correctly. So you're asking me why, how, I, how I killed off the Jane Krentz name? Why I killed it off? No, no. Well, you got it associated with, as my mom used to say, don't associate with the wrong people. Uh, but uh, well, there uh, wasn't. A, it, it was just the, the flat out answer is that there was no market for it. Yeah, but science fiction people didn't want the romance, yeah. and the romance readers didn't want the uh, science fiction at the time. The landscape has changed as landscapes do change. But one of the other lessons I learned in all this is that you better respect the conventions of your genre. 
Yes, you can bend them, but if you break them too dramatically, you're going to lose your audience. And um, perfect example of that from the mystery side of things. Everybody knows what the British police procedural looks like, right? Everybody knows what the American police procedural looks like. Tip of the day, the difference between the two is that the American police procedural, the cops are the bad guys. In the, in the, American, in the American, we invented that dirty cop story pretty much. Um, but my point is readers of one rarely read the other. If you like that American style noir, um, big city cop story in the, set in the US, you probably don't read the British version of it and vice versa. If you read cozies, small town, you know, the cozy mystery, you probably don't want either of those procedural mysteries. People are very, um, very stuck, stuck isn't the right word, but they're very, much in love with certain fictional landscapes. Some of them are easier for readers to slide into than others. The hardest thing to do in this business is invent a new fictional landscape and expect a lot of readers to follow you. For example, most readers are very comfortable in a gaslight London sort of setting because Everybody knows something about Sherlock Holmes and we have an instant, an instant fix on that world. So it's easy for a mystery writer to set a mystery in that world and not have to explain every minute part of it because the audience knows what, what the Sherlock Holmes world looks like. <laughs> and they know it because they've just seen so much of it. Um, the same thing is true for romance readers would be Regency London. You don't have to do a heck of a lot of description on Regency London because romance readers have been there before. They love it. Um, the American Western. Um, what else? There's just a, a ton of established fictional landscapes. Gilded Age New York is popular in, um, in the cozy world. For, uh, cozy, the, the historical Lady Sleuth mystery, which is a world unto itself, um, is, is a, is, Gilded Age is popular for that setting. And I'm um, trying to think of others, but my point is that most readers are familiar with some or all of those worlds. They're, they know the difference between the hard science fiction landscape and the fantasy science fiction landscape. And they usually don't cross over. People who read fantasy science fiction rarely read hardcore science science fiction and vice versa. So my point is that if you're going to go into one of these worlds and really stir it up, feel free to do that, but know that the risk is pushing it to the point where readers will not, that's not what they come to that world for. One of the things I really worried about when I started up my Amanda Quick, my new Amanda Quick world, which is set in 1930s um, California, the, the glamour glitz style of the 1930s, okay? The, the image that the studio sold the world, not the depression side of things. I went, I was going for the glamour and the glitz. I was going for what everybody could recognize because of the old movies. And I worried because there had been a lot of mystery set in that world, but there is almost no romantic suspense. It's just never caught on there. So my having killed off a few careers in the past, the last thing I wanted to do was make that mistake again. Um, so I talked there with my editor. We agreed to give it a shot. And, and I was just praying that the whole um, glam factor, you know, everybody associates with 1930s California would kick in and it did. So, whew, but that was a risk. And my research ahead of that as a writer was to get hold of the Seattle Public Library reference people and say, what is there written in this world that looks like anything close to romantic suspense? And with, that's, that's how I realized there wasn't anything out there. And that's what, frankly, it worried me, but um, I was at a point in my career where I could take the risk. So uh, did that answer the question? It's just, it's, yeah, it's the, the market, if you're starting from scratch, the market probably just isn't there and you're gonna to have to figure out how to build it. If you're building a world that has got no resemblance to anything that exists, 
that's a tough hill to climb. So, any other questions? Um, let me turn on chat here. Ah, finally, something works <laughs> for me from my end. Um, do you think the core story extends to nonfiction writers? I wouldn't be surprised if it did. I, that's a good question, and I don't see why not. But I'm not. I don't want to go there. Um, I would say that every writer is compelled to write from some core passion, some core emotion. And I, I can certainly see where you could make an argument that that would be true in 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 nonfiction. But I'm kind of winging it there. I don't really write it. So the, my one my one foray into nonfiction was that book that you mentioned, the one that uh, the romance writers on the appeal of the romance novel, which was uh, an academic book. And there were 19 of us writing essays. <laughs> It took a year out of my life, and I will never go there again. <laughs> this is not me, um, because I want to tell a story, and and I don't want to stand there and have to explain why my story works to, to a bunch of people who don't don't want to figure it out for themselves. I, I guess I'm just not into 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 fiction, into nonfiction. I do read a lot of nonfiction, though. I think that is. Um, I think that's because it gives me a break from the from fiction. It's like my fall, you know. It's a little vacation, if you will. From um, and plus, I get the best ideas from uh, nonfiction um, plot in terms of plots. Not so much not emotional ideas, but um, plot ideas. I'll often pick up from nonfiction. Uh, that's one of the fun things about doing the 1930s series is how much. Um, how much wild invention was going on? Uh, things we didn't even, didn't even know, like the first fax machines, you know, television, they're, they're, uh, robots. Um, it was it was the whole spirit of the 30s for, was the future was going to be great <laughs> and we're going to make it great. And that fits my kind of characters. And the reason I deliberately chose California instead of the East Coast or the Midwest was because the whole myth of the West Coast, the whole myth of California was built on, this is where you could reinvent yourself from scratch. And my characters tend to be entrepreneurial and they don't have old money, they don't have old lineages that go back to the old world. They're, they're at some point in their life, they're starting over. And the, the West Coast gives that kind of, of, as the myth goes with that, Kind of reinvention, I guess. Plus, I was raised out here, so I just have you know more of a sense of it. So, um, yeah, but that's a good question about the about the nonfiction. I'd be interested in hearing from some nonfiction people. Any playing with my my phone here? Speaking, Laura. Um, can I ask a question in terms of? Um, people not necessarily following a different genre. Do you also find that um, publishers want a particular genre, that a particular genre is hot currently and another one is not? And it's better to write in a genre that's being currently published? Okay, it's, it's tough to be that breakout author that invents a new genre. It's not that uh, it's not that editors and agents don't want to see it. It's just that you can't count on them knowing it when they see it. Um, I, I, I've been ahead of the curve in this business enough times to know that's not a good place to be, for, at least not for me. I've also been behind, I've never chased genres because they always say if you're chasing a genre, it's too late anyway. But think in terms of established genres because there is nothing you invent won't fit somewhere. It's going to fit an old, it's going to fit a genre. Um, and it's up to you to figure it out, but make it look fresh. The trick is to make it look fresh because there are no new genres. Trust me on this. You're going to be finding a, a place for your book. And it, it's a very good idea to be able to tell the editor or the agent where this market is. 
And there's lots of buzzwords, psychological suspense, modern Gothic, um, police procedural, um, you know, just there's a gazillion subgenres under every major genre. And the, and the literary genre is very much a genre. It has its own conventions. And again, if you break them, you're gonna have a tough time being taken seriously as a literary author. So I I think it's I think it's a good idea to have a sense of where the book, where the market will be for your book when you send it in, just as a practical, pragmatic thing. Sending in the most original story, the most original plot, the most original characters, the most original world. It's, it could be the brass ring. You might hit it, but I think it's going to be a tough sell. Because everybody is back who buys books is in the business to make money. They want to know where the market is. And you were describing the question I'm like, um, you were describing a couple of genres that are popular right now. So is it best to write in those genres because they're more likely to get picked up by a publisher? Oh, timing is everything. Okay. And I don't, I would think that still psychological suspense or, or what I call the modern Gothic is, um, is probably a good place to be. Another popular genre right now that's going strong, and I think it will stay strong, is the historical lady sleuth. And these are uh, Sujata Massey, for example, uh, Victoria Thompson, Anna Lee Huber. Um, these, they're calling, I, Sujata, who writes uh, this kind of story, uh, historical lady sleuth, this is where you take a, a woman of the time, but she's ahead of the time in terms of her thinking and everything but she's thrust into that world where the, the rules are more rigid and more easily seen. And against that world, against that backdrop, say the 19, the 1800s or the early 1900s, um, our heroines, uh, Deanna Rayburn, for example, with her, her historical series, um, uses the strictures of that world to il illustrate the problems of women and that are applicable to today's world. Does that make sense? If, if you get what I'm saying there, um, that happens to be a very strong genre right now. So that would be another one to consider. Um, but I, this gothic thing and this suspense thing and this unreliable narrator, I don't think it's going to be slowing down anytime soon. I think people love it. It's very popular. The tr like I said, there's kind of an arms race going down right now. Um, because it does, uh, it does, it does hinge on on twists, and I think the problem with writing a book that's solid, you know, just shock, 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 is that people don't remember it. Um, they don't. It's like candy; they eat it and then they go on to the next shock book. You know, it doesn't. They're not really paying attention to authors. Um, that's, I would say, the, the problem with the unreliable narrator, because that's basically what that's all about. And I don't know if there's a, I, I don't want to say don't go there, but I'm saying that might be a, a risky place to go right now. Hang on, because I got to make the phone call again. Calling Virginia Beach. <laughs> Lost you. Indicate to me that you're not asking us yeah if yeah the the chat chat would be very helpful if you could put it in the chat the question in the chat type type <laughs> somebody type something <laughs> um i'm not too familiar with i know i know that the thriller genre is still hot it will always be a it'll always be a hot genre but I don't think we're going to see a whole lot more of the kind of superhero thriller, if you know what I mean. Um, save the world kind of setting. Right now, the trend seems to be toward a more intimate kind of of thriller, where the where the and that's why the that's why the new gothic is fitting in so well because it's essentially it's 
the danger is from within. The danger is from within the community, from within the family, from within, um, which is why the, the big old house works so well, right? Because it's the ancestral home has so many secrets and everything. Um, but the intimate thrill thriller is, I think, ascendant right now. And that requires a more character driven kind of story. So we got a question here. Somebody typed, thank you, Susan. <laughs> that was you, you Susan. Um, okay. Do you, oh, from Melissa, do you write for pleasure? I'll always <laughs> curious if successful authors continue to journal or use writing as a tool for self-discovery since so much of their work life is already devoted to the page. Do I write for pleasure? I write because I have to. It's what I need to do. It's my, it's an obsession. And if I weren't able to sell the books, I'd be publishing, um, I'd be writing anyway. And I'd find a way to, I'd pro well, the, the beauty now is you could, you can self-publish. That was not an option when I started out, which, which will tell you how old I am. But, um, but yes, today the options are unlimited for writing. And even if I were, if I, if, even if I did not have a New York based career in terms of, you know, the hardcovers and the, and the, the, the traditional market, as they say, I would definitely be publishing um, on my own right now because the need to tell the story is, I don't, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd call it a pleasure so much as a as an obsession. It's just part of who I am now. It became an addiction at some point. It did, it didn't start out that way. It started out. I was a reader first. I think most writers will tell you they were readers from an early age. Um, I was a reader first, and there just came a time when I wanted to tell the story my way. It wasn't that I thought I could do it better than the people I was reading. I didn't, I never had that kind of sense, but I just needed to tell it my way with my kind of dialogue and my kind of characters. Um, so that's, that's, I don't do journaling and I don't do um, that kind of personal, I never did the journaling or the diary type writing. I don't know why, I just, I wanted to, always wanted to tell stories. Um, so you had a question earlier from Laurel. Is speculative fiction very secure? Okay. Um, there's always going to be that market. It's a stable market. I don't think it's a huge market. But yes, it's out there and it's stable. And your job would be to identify the publishers or the, or if you're self-publishing to find that market. Um, and you, probably the easiest way to do that is to look at who, who you're reading in that world, you know, who the writers that um, that you want to go read there. That's one of your biggest clues to tell you where you should be writing. I think Does you usually want to start out, you usually want to write something along what you love to read. That's how most writers get started. And that can change over time, but I think that'll give you a core, I mean, a, a direction to start in. I was looking back to see if I missed anything. Um, ah, when you're beginning a new story or a series, where do you usually start? Does it begin with a character, the setting, the genre and its conventions, an image or single line? Okay, so once you know your core story, you're always going to be starting from that viewpoint, whether you know it or not. That's just, and mine is that trust, two people having to learn to trust each other. But I already know that I love to read romantic suspense, and that's the kind of story I'm always going to write, unless something dramatically happens, I don't know what it would be. Um, I'm not sure I could plot without suspense to tell you the, the truth. Nothing nothing would happen. I don't know what, I don't know how I'd move the story along. Um, the thing about romantic suspense is that it really is its own thing. It's not just, it's not straight romance and it is not straight suspense. It's a story in which every action in the suspense has to generate an action in the relationship and vice versa. That's a lockstep kind of thing and that's what makes it work and that's what makes it unique. The characters aren't going to be so, again, the value of knowing my core story, my characters are always, my lead characters, my heroes and my heroines 
are always going to share pretty much the same core values. That's, those are my hero. That's what I write. That's, those are the kind of characters I love as heroes and heroines. So I try to give them individual personalities, but fundamentally underneath that is the core values that they, that they have. And that probably is, I can't see changing that dramatically because I'd be writing some alien kind of character, alien to me. Um, I save the other kinds of stuff, the, the stuff that, that I don't like. I'll put that into the bad guys, okay? <laughs> That's what bad guys are for. <laughs> um, so the storyline isn't, I, I don't go into it worrying too much about the characters. My characters are basically stick figures to me for the first half of the book. I don't get to know them until I'm like halfway into the book. And I don't know them completely until I reach the end of the first draft. That's when I have the vision of the book, the characters, their problems. And that's when I can see the whole thing. And that's when I'll go back to the beginning and that second and third draft are my sweet spot. That's where I know where I'm going and I can write toward that vision that I now have. But the first, the first draft is really messy. And I change my mind. I change it, not just the characters' names, but I mean, I change their whole back histories and everything. Is I've never been one to be able to, um, I'm not saying this is not a bad thing to be able to do. I just can't do it. Where I, where I can give you a, an outline of each character before I even start the book. That is not something I can do. I've tried it, and it will, no matter what I decide, inevitably it's going to change. So I just don't try to even frustrate myself that way anymore. I let it happen on the page. Because here's what happens with me, and I think it actually happens with a lot of writers where they just don't talk about it very much. I get my best ideas once I start writing not before I start writing when it would be really useful to have your best ideas. I could save a heck of a lot of time if I knew where I was going up front, but I don't. And I've kind of made peace with that and learned to live with it. So when I start out, I have to have, a, I have that first line, that first scene has to be something that I find exciting. I'm not worried about backstory at this point. I don't want to bore this or the reader with backstory because I don't even know the backstory at this point. So I'll start out with, with um, well, uh, a woman, the, the book that's coming out in January, for example, um, um, Lightning in a Mirror. Um, she's getting out of her car in a garage. She's walking across. It's one of those horrible um, alone in a, in a parking lot garage, you know, a big concrete parking lot garage at late at night when nobody should be there alone and, and you're walking toward the elevator door and you, you know, you see the guy coming toward you and you know, this is not good. This is, this is the serial killer everybody's been talking about and, and you're going to fight, find your way out of it. So that's, for me, that was an exciting place to start the book. And once I started writing, questions come up. Well, how is she going to get out of this situation? Then you start answering those questions. You start, it triggers the whole process of creativity for me, which is asking questions and answering them. And that's what writing a book is for me. Um, oh, but your question reminds me, I did one tip of the day. I've got three tips for you. I actually wrote them down somewhere. But I, the, the tip of the day is one of the ways that authors have traditionally hid their core stories in plain sight is by creating them in a series. Nobody, nobody questions it if you have the same hero 15 books in a row. Nobody thinks twice if you have the same cast of characters. 20 books later, you got a career. Um, and it's very common in mystery and suspense to, to do that. It's... Um, over the romance genre, the women's fiction genre, we'll see uh, uh, authors will often create a small town with a cast of characters, then either bring people into, you know, bring a fresh couple into that town or take a couple in that town and give them a story. Um, but basically, we're the whole thing is framed with the small town and its background, and people come back for that setting. And um, so, think if you are worried about or trying. Trying series self. So that's always a good thing to mention if you're trying to market your book. Tell them this is the first book of a series, okay? And then make sure you set it up that you could, <laughs> if lightning strikes, you could actually add something else to that, start that plot mix. 
but a series of any kind is a great way of of um, of mask hiding hiding in plain sight what the kind of core story you want to do um the small town setting for example is very often a, a story of second chances and redemption people coming home and finding what they ran from you know or re re fixing what got broken in the past you know that's a that's the small town setting works very well for that and uh, mysteries have an almost unlimited scope for for settings and uh, you could create your setting and then just pick a character that you can continue with and sometimes that'll when i started the burning cove series which is my 1930s california series that i'm writing under amanda quick when i started that series i didn't realize that the two people who showed up in the first book would become kind of the heart and soul of the series. Uh, Luther Pell, the nightclub owner, and Raina Kirk, who travels all the way from New York, got down, was running from something awful and hit uh, Route 66 and drove all the way to California to start her new life. And she's now running an investigation agency in Burning Cove. And Luther, of course, has mob connections, but also connections with the FBI. <laughs> he was a leftover, uh, he was a, a re, re -invented, reinvented um, um, spy from the First World War. So he's got a set of skill set from the First World War from spies and stuff. Um, and the whole fallout from the First World War, you know, because after that war, there was the same problems every war leaves. And that there's a lot of uh, fuel for the 1930s plots based on that. Anyhow, what I was getting at is that the, very often when you start a series, um, leave, leave, leave as many doors open as possible. Don't write yourself into a corner that you then have to figure out how to open later. Um, that, that's why towns work very well. You can add it, add or subtract anything you want from a, a mythical town. But um, anyhow, that's I think series are worth considering as a not only because publishers love series. Because once you, once two or three books are out and they're working, then you've got them locked. The readers are locked in for twenty years, so they work. So let's see what else I'm missing here. Um, could you say a little more about the about connecting our core story with our author's voice that you mentioned briefly? Do you see the voice following the core story through different genres? Okay. I don't really think authors can change their voice too much. I think the best thing you can do is figure out what your voice does best and then play to those strengths and sharpen it. Don't try to change it. I tend to write light. I tend to write like um, repartee, snappy dialogue. Um, which I love to do. It fits very well with the 1930s. It does not fit well with the modern Gothic. Um, I, I probably shouldn't go, shouldn't try to write the modern Gothic, even though it's very powerful right now, or the psychological suspense, because I don't write dark enough, if you know what I mean. It's and I, and every time I try to go in that direction, I end up coming back. I just, I, it's not doesn't fit my voice. Um, so the first step in identifying a voice is figure out if you have a, a natural feel for narrative or a natural feel for dialogue. Most authors fall into one of those two camps. Um, it doesn't mean you're not going to have to do the other, but, but figure it out. If you're a dialogue driven author, certain stories are going to work better for you. And if you're a narrative driven author, um, you'll probably be really good at modern Gothic and psychological suspense because they depend so much on atmosphere. And atmosphere is easiest and most natural, I think, for authors who, who are narrative driven. And there's a big scope for those kinds of stories. Uh, I would just like to do a uh, a plug here for, for my books. If you happen to come across a paragraph of description in one of my books, I would I would really appreciate it if you'd slow down and read it slowly because it probably took me an hour or two to write it. <laughs> You're going to read it in five sentences. It's not my, I get very bored with doing narrative. I just want, once the characters start talking to each other, 
I'm flying. But when I have to slow down and describe anything, the dress, the setting, the, the landscape, the, the sunset, I, I, that's, that's not, that doesn't excite me as a writer very much. Because I, I hear the story, I do not see the story, which is another way of finding where your voice belongs or how your voice works. Most authors will tell you they either see it unfolding like a film or they hear it. And either either way works, but um, it's helpful to know how your your creative creative process, uh, if you're visual or auditory, I guess would be the other word. Um, and I'm I hear it. So mention creating new fictional landscapes. I've this is from so hang on here. Uh -huh. Mention release. Okay. You mentioned um, <laughs> this little tiny print over here on the right hand side. Okay. <laughs> um, creating new fictional landscapes. I've seen that it is popular for some authors to work together, creating a new fictional landscape and worlds, writing stories within this landscape from different points of view. I, and what do I think of it? Uh, I, I think it's great, but I can't do it. I cannot collaborate. I just, um, my stories are too, to me and too intimate and I, to me, and I just, um, I think some people, it depends on how you work. Um, and for writing to me is a very solitary, very uh, inner sort of thing. And my story is my story. And I, I don't want anybody coming into my world, <laughs> messing with it. <laughs> so, so I think it's just a, strictly a personal thing. If you can, um, I, I think I've seen that done more in science fiction. Um, but I'm and but I'm but I am seeing it now in women's in what used to be called um, women's fiction and psychological suspense. You're right; it's happening out there. Um, that's going to be a per purely personal decision for each author. Just be <laughs> remember, you've got friends, and you don't <laughs> you do not want to lose friends over a over a book project that went bad. I'm just just a warning there. Um, oh, do you have someone help you with the social media? Oh. <laughs> Well, you saw me today trying to get on, get on this, get on this WebEx or whatever it is. Um, not really. I have someone who, who who can give me some tech support, um, an assistant who can help me load something that I can't figure out how to get loaded. The problem with social media is t you can't. I think it's very difficult to turn it over to anybody else because it's so dependent on voice, your voice. Um, and I guess if you had a, someone who could, who could sound, invent either a personality for you or sound like your personality, I guess if they were that skilled, that would be, that would be real nice. I wouldn't object to that. I just never, I just, I don't know who that would be. I don't know how you find someone like that. I suspect that at, at the, a lot of authors have found assistants who can do it semi, but my guess is most of them come in and give it their give, give a post or write their own posts or you know do their own photography and stuff just to have because it, it, it's them you know everybody on, who's looking at it online is going to think that that's her or that's him and you don't want somebody impersonating you it's just but at the same time it. It is very um, time consuming. The social media thing is time consuming and you're going to be stuck with it. It's just part of the business now. Um, here we go. You mentioned creating new fictional landscapes. Um, oh, okay. We've got that one going. Do you have someone help you? Got that one. Um, did you ever finish a draft and realize that your characters have changed so much? or you know them so much better that they would no longer make the same decisions that begin the book. Oh yeah. Once the characters, I, I don't know the characters really till the end of the book. And I, I often change the beginnings based on what I found out about them. Yeah. That's kind of routine for me. Um, that's why I don't try to nail the whole story down in my head before I start writing. Cause it would be a waste of time. And I think that I'd feel, frustrated every time I realized I was leaving the path 
but leaving the path is how I write, and I don't want to get in the way of the process, so that's my process, which is um, someone asked, so you go back and build the characters, their mannerisms, speech and flaws, yeah. I'm not saying this is the best way to write people. I'm just saying this is where <laughs> I've been doing this for a few years now, and this is how I do it. Uh, I'm not recommending it. It's just, I'm, this is me. Um, every author will have their own process, and whatever works for you works. Don't even worry about it. it just try different approaches. I tried the outline approach. I tried the deep. I know authors who will do a 15,000-word a outline basically or synopsis and then sit down and write the 90,000 word book. Um, I couldn't do that. If I did write the 15,000 word synopsis, it might, part of me would have been, would have, would feel like I told the story. I want a new story. I've already done it. So that would be the downside of me trying to do that style. Um, the, the writers I know who do that kind of writing, tell me they can't they can't do my way because it is so it produces so much anxiety because you don't know what you're going to do the next day and that is the truth for me i um writing a book is is a not knowing where it's going is not 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 good for the nerves which is probably why a lot of authors drink um let's see if you are if you are a more dialogue driven writer, what genres make more sense to write? Well, the 1930s is working really well because it's kind of the whole thing works well. Basically, the 20th and 21st century work fine for dialogue, um, and they work fine for what am I saying? The 19th century, I, the Regency London thing is perfect for for dialogue driven books. Um, I don't think it's limited to anything. It's more whether you're going to write um, like snappy dialogue or intense, um, um, what would be the right, emotional dialogue. I think that would be the question. It isn't the dialogue per se, it's whether you're going to be writing a more emotional, intensely emotional story or a, um, a lighter, more humorous kind of story. That would be what you'd want to, that would be, that might determine what genres you go into. Uh, but that said, within every genre, there's light and dark. So I hate, I don't want to draw any rules here because there really aren't a lot of rules. Um, someone asked, so you go back and build characters. Yeah, we did that. If you are more of a dialogue, got that. Uh, is YA a, is popular currently? YA is always going to be popular. This is a category that we're always going to want. The revelation about YA in the past few years is the fact that um, uh, so many adults read it. It is not just YA for young adult readers. When I was a little girl, the everybody knew what a YA book looked like, right? Um, that's not true anymore. So uh, yes, because it has actually a, a wider reach now than it ever had, that's always going to be a solid market. I will tell you that the young adult writers I know, and the children's writers too, are very conscious of their mission, their calling, and they're very aware of what they are putting into the minds of children. They have a mission and a passion, and that's why the kids love it, because they pick up on that energy and and they just they just love it. Um, and a lot of the authors have told me that they can go back to their young adult years or their childhoods and re and see it again like a film um, like a film. I can't do that. All I've got from my past are snapshots. But young adult people will tell you they can just they can slip right back into the emotional uh, in the emotional roller coaster they were on in high school, for example. I just, I just remember this. I just don't want to go back there. <laughs> so, but, but if you're if you're called to write young adult or children's books, probably you can step right back into that emotional landscape. So that would be the secret of writing YA. That's how you 
that's how you find that audience because the, the the young readers glom onto it instantly. They they just they know it when they see it. Um, what is my writing routine like? <laughs> Besides from messy, um, I'm about all I can tell you is I'm a morning person, so most of my creativity is in the when I you know like I'm at the computer by seven and. I'm probably exhausted by noon. Whatever I do after that will be more of a maybe editing or research or um, shopping, <laughs> Nordstrom, <laughs> um, getting online. It's it's the, you know it it's the afternoons are a different um, different kind of work. So, but the, for me, the creative work is in the morning. But that is purely just because I'm a morning person. And I know other people who write best in the middle of the night. So again, there's no rules on that one. I, I do a first draft and that's a slog because it, it I often don't know where I'm going and, until I get there. One of the reasons I can handle this psychologically is because I think in terms of scenes, not the whole book. And I see every scene in a book as a little short story. And it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it goes somewhere. And it's a little story unto itself. And that's how I move from scene to scene, chapter to chapter, from the start, first chapter to the end. Uh, the, the, the scenes the scenes are little short stories that teach me something about the characters or what I need to do with the plot. And the, the advantage of thinking in terms of scenes is that a day's work is a scene, maybe two scenes max. Um, so it gives me a sense of a day ending and a day, you know, what to see what I mean? It's psychologically, it, it, it gives me a sense of satisfaction that I got a little story done today um, and hopefully have an idea for tomorrow. <laughs> Usually what will happen in the course of writing those scenes is questions will come up that I then have something else I need to write. And I know have some, I know what the next scene needs to be or a scene five, five pages in or five chapters in what it should look like. I have often and more so frequently than I did in the past, but more and more because my my suspense plots have become more involved, more the more suspense you write, the more complicated you try to make your story because you're always looking for something to entertain yourself. And usually you have to go back and 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 rip out a lot of the complications because they don't work. But um but, but I'm, when I'm writing, I'm trying to entertain myself, and I do that with the complications. And um, I think that overcomplicating a plot is one of my biggest problems. But somewhere along the line, it all kind of comes together. And I don't want to overcomplicate plots because nobody nobody reads a story for the plot. The plot is what is the I see the plot as the fuel that just kind of energizes it, but it's not. The, or I guess the plot would be the car and the characters are the fuel. Maybe that's the way I'm, I'm trying to think of the right metaphor here. Um, but nobody reads for plot, right? They need, they read because they care about what happens to the characters. And that's, but everybody knows that. That's nothing, nothing new. I didn't invent that one. Do you always write uh, through a draft chronologically or do you skip around scenes? What I think what I was starting to say earlier is I do skip around now more than I used to. I used to write much more linearly. And in the past couple of years, I have um, I realized something somewhere. Usually, I usually start, I know where I'm going for the first three chapters or so, so like that. And then that's when things get murky. But in those three chapters, I'll have a question, at least one or two or maybe more questions. And I'll sometimes jump ahead to write, write a chapter that answers that question. And then the, depending on how I answer that question, I can go back, back and forth and maybe other, maybe other scenes come up or other scenes um, come to me. So like a, it's really a chaotic process for me. I'm sorry. It was a lot of chaos. And then somewhere at the end, it's all there. At least for me. And all you can do is hope the the readers will be able to get into it. And you know, the basic thing about this this 
the writing business is not everybody's going to love everything you do. That's just all. Everybody responds differently to a voice. If you think, if you want to have a, a sense of how important the writer's voice is, think about the narrators in audiobooks. And everybody who loves audiobooks will tell you that a good narrator can make a bad story work and a bad narrator can ruin a great story. It's so important. And it's, it's that old storytelling voice. And when you're writing, that's what you have is a storytelling voice. And like I said, you want to play, to, figure out what it is and then play to your strengths. Uh, another Q&A one. I guess you don't like the description <laughs> because you're there with the characters. You don't need the, to describe because you see it all. Well, maybe that's, yeah, maybe that's it. I don't, it's there. I don't want to stop and describe it. Um, you want to listen to what your characters are saying because that's exciting. Yes, you don't know what they're going to say next. That's it. That's, you got it. <laughs> that's, um, do you always write through a draft chronologically or do you skip around? Okay, I think we got that one. So I'm caught up here. Um, next question. I'm trying to, th if there's anything else, you know, I'm not covering that you want to hear, just feel free to put it in the chat there. And uh, trying to think of anything else. I I can tell you that the pandemic has been good for the book business. Um, turns out people really have been reading more, just like we've been hearing. Um, oh, how do you make sure you don't do an info dump in your character's dialogue? That's a good question because you often I do it and then I just go back later and take it out. Very often I'll do it because I'm telling, they're telling me the story. That's how dialogue driven I am. They're actually telling me um, what happened to them. Which brings up another tip that some writers I know find very useful, which is when you're really stuck is to interview a character in dialogue on, pa on the page. Just do the info dump in essence, like, what are you doing here? Why did you do that? And you'd be surprised how the characters will talk back to you if you just ask the questions. And that's not something that's going to go into the story. It's going to be, it's going to be background, but um, it can be very useful to you, the writer. So interviewing characters has worked for me. Um, yes. What is your relationship with your editor like? Have you worked with the same editor all the way through your career? No. I've <laughs> <laughs> I burned out a lot of editors. <laughs> um, you know, the business, I, I've been in the business for a few decades now, so editors come and go. I have a fabulous editor now, um, Cindy Wong at Berkeley Publishing. And what makes her a fabulous editor, what makes any editor a fabulous editor, is that they get your story. They get your core story. They know what you're trying to do, even if you get to start to flounder. They have a sense of your kind of story and they'll get you back on track if you get off track. That is not a common thing, however. Most of the time you're going to have to fix your problems yourself. Um, no, nobody is going to rescue you, so to speak, and say, well, you've got a good story here. Let's do this, this, and this. They just don't have time. Even if they wanted to, they don't have the time in the business anymore. So. Um, your story had better be darn near close to publishable before you send it in. It's just the nature of the beast now. You're not going to get a lot of help from somebody who will help you rewrite the book. It doesn't happen. So uh, my relationship with my editor now is fabulous. Um, I've been very fortunate in my editor in recent years. In the early days, not so much. And that's a very frustrating experience. But over time, you, you do realize you have power. You have some power as a writer, too. And you can say, <laughs> a lot of writers will joke about the one-third, one-third, one-third rule, which is that one-third of what they say. What One-third of the editorial comments are reasonable. You should pay attention to them. One-third are neutral. They won't make any difference. It's just her voice or your voice or his voice or your voice. But it's not, it's not really affecting the manuscript. In that case, you stick with your voice. And one third are going to be bad. So they, they go against the grain of the story. So I don't know if that's a fair, a fair, a fair rendering of, of editorial comments. I will say that 
a good editor, the editorial consents, comments tend to be few, but very insightful. And it's usually because they're pointing you back in the direction you, you really want to go anyway. They know, they get the vision. Um, what are your thoughts on small publishers versus the big five? You know, I think right now it's just easier to get published with a small publisher. The problem with the big five is that it's really hard to break in. You've got, it's almost all going through an agent. Um, the, there's no more slush pile as they used to call it. Uh, not, at, not at the big five. They work through agents and every agent, they use the agents as their gatekeepers, okay? So getting the agent is harder now than actually it used to be to get an editor at a big publisher. But now you're trying to get an agent. However, the smaller publishers offer that other option. They are often inviting either queries or um, sample chapters. Um, and that's probably where, I mean, that, basically I started out with a small publisher and if I were starting out again today, I'd be looking at every small publisher I could find. Um, I'd be querying every agent I could find too, but um, it's hard to get an agent now. I'm you know, not, not gonna kid you. It's, um, they want guaranteed sales, you know. If you're new, it's tough. There's also the, the other route in would be online. Some careers have been built on self-publishing, uh, some spectacular careers, um, the Andy Weir uh, career that um, um, Project Hail Mary that, you know, the book that's all over the New York Times right now. Um, his first book, The Martian, started out as self-publishing. And I think the, the legendary uh, Diana Gabaldon story, the uh, Gabaldon, um, the Outlander series that started out online. So yes, that is a possibility. Build an audience online, then go to a agent or an editor with something that shows, you know, an audience is out there for it. Um, how do you balance or juggle researching the historical period context and staying focused on writing? Okay, one of the thing, one of, one of the tricks for doing a historical period is to pick one set your set a series in that world and then you're not going to have to repeat the research every single time okay um pick the gaslight world pick the regency london pick the gilded age pick the 1930s pick the 1940s pick the war pick uh you know just find the world you want to tell your stories in and then for the first book there's going to be a learning curve there's no question about it but at the end of it, you're going to know what you need to know to write and what you don't need to know. And you'll be wasting less time on information that's not helpful and going answering questions that you know have to be answered. A lot of historical writers will tell you they don't worry about the research till they get to the question. So you can, um, you, if you've got a ballroom scene, um, you stop and then go research Regency ballrooms or Gilded Age ballrooms. Um, dresses, clothes, chandeliers, that kind of thing, get a feel for it, um, then keep going until the next question arises. And the same thing with um, with any era is get your background, get your get, get your feet, feet on the ground in a, in a world initially. And then after that, each book, um, you'll, you'll stop when you need to stop and go research that problem and come back. I, I, sometimes you, people love research, writers love their research. So it's, you know, it's, it could be a real time sink too. And that's probably one of the, the, the side effects. But um, I was fast, you get fascinated with the stuff. Like I had no idea that the um, robots were such a big deal in the 1930s. I mean, I'd seen the covers of the old uh, science fiction magazines and I knew they had, you know, aliens and spaceships and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but the robot, the robot thing was really a big deal. And for the same reasons it is today, which is that people feared it was going, they were going to take jobs, that people would use robots and workers would not be able to find work. Um, 
robots would turn into killers. Uh, robots would take over the world. Um, it was a big, you know, all the fears we sort of see in them, like the Terminator kind of thing, they were back in the 1930s. <laughs> but at the same time, people were fascinated with them because they were very fascinated with anything mechanical in those days, as I guess we always are. Look at Jeff Bezos and going to, <laughs> into, in, up into space today. So um, like, it's just human nature to be fascinated with this kind of stuff. <laughs> but So I'm reading along and I'm finding some amazing things like... Um, there was a movie from the 1920s, a silent film actually, called Metropolis, which it's, it, I don't know that you could ever watch, it's hard to find the whole thing anywhere. I think I think I finally found it online. It's been one of those, one of those movies that's almost lost. But the imagery of the robot from Metropolis is the same one we've got today. It's just fascinating. The character, there's a robot in the, in the movie called Maria. And Maria is the sensual, metallic, metal, female, female shaped object. Um, and it's just, and you look at it and you think, holy crap, you know, that's, <laughs> that's where it all came from. That's where the whole imagery for, for killer robots and everything came from was Metropolis. It's a really interesting film. Um, and in 1939 at the World's Fair in New York, the biggest attraction was a smoking robot Westinghouse brought in, <laughs> and it would it would it would take a puff and then answer a question and then take a puff and answer a question. <laughs> so um, so I don't know that kind of stuff. And then I don't know I could go on and on. See, I get I get kind of sucked in with the um, something like that or the Enigma. How about that? The Enigma machine because everybody kind of thinks they know what the Enigma machine was. I had no idea there were thousands of them. You know, you think of the Enigma machine because we're all, that was the famous um, break for the, for World War II and, you know, solving the code on the Enigma machine. Well, who knew they'd been making Enigmas since 1919? It, it was, it was like, it was like a IBM computer. Everybody, any, all the large companies around the world had Enigma machines. And the only difference, it was a significant difference, but the only difference between the ones the Germans locked down um, was it was just more complicated. But the reason they were actually able to break the code was because it was still based on the same rotors, the same design inside the machine as from the very original Enigmas. See, I'm boring you now with all my, this is what happens when the author starts talking about research. Don't get me going there. Um, okay, thank goodness we have another question here. You've written so many books. Um, have you set any of your stories outside of the USA? And if so, is it vital to visit the country of your book's location? Well, I sure didn't do it for the Regency London and Victorian London. I, I didn't, I've been there, but not in relationship to, to researching the books. Um, and that's the only time I've been, set a book outside the US. So that's all I can tell you. Um, I suspect it would be a wise idea if you're going to be doing anything anything where you want to pull in a lot of history or a serious nature like that. But I got to tell you, a lot of writers aren't traveling to the places they're writing about. I mean, they use their imaginations and they use the online resources, Google Earth. Um, one thing that helps, that can be helpful is to decide which way you're going to lean the reality or the myth. We will always be rewriting history. We are constantly rewriting history. 50 years from now, the history of today is going to look a lot different from what we're looking at. The 1930s will look different from the historical point 50 years from now. But the myth will probably still remain strong. Myths don't change very much over time. And as a writer, I go, I lean toward the myth. I want the, the mythical legendary side of my world, my time, my story, not the hard um, or, the, or the reality side, if you will, um, because that's gonna get rewritten anyway. So that's why I say when I, when I, when I went into the 1930s, 
yes, I'll reference the depression. I'll reference the crash of 1929. I'll reference the war coming, the war that's coming, because that those things I'll sprinkle through the story. But that's not what I'm leaning the story on. I'm leaving the story on the glamour and the um, the mystique of the 1930s. That's what I'm pulling on. So it helps if you decide ahead of time whether you're trying to do a true to history kind of story or free yourself up to do the mythic and the, the legend. Um, I think there's a, somebody told me there's a great line from a movie called um, Liberty, Li The Legend of Liberty Valance. Does that ring a bell? Liberty Valance. It's a, it's a kind of a classic Western movie. But at the end of the movie, the reporter who's going to expose the truth about who really killed Liberty Valance, who shot, the man who shot Liberty Valance. That's the, that's the movie, yeah. And, and <laughs> um, so in the end, the reporter, he's going to expose the fact that it wasn't, it wasn't a heroic gunfight, you know, the old West Corral kind of thing at all. And, um, but, but Liberty Valance is dead and somebody's getting the credit for it. And the reporter says, he tosses his notes into the fire, I guess, and says, um, when the man becomes the legend, write the legend. And that's kind of where I come down on. Um, and, and legends last, myths last. And they do that because they're powered by emotion underneath. There's really strong emotions. Nobody cares about facts in the sense of, of was it hot or cold that day? You know, what they care about was whether or not these two people are going to kill each other. Um, okay, so... I would say it's probably a good idea to do the research if you can, but I wouldn't worry about it as much as people probably think I should worry about it. So I, I don't want to, it also may depend on whether you're a narrative driven person. Remember, I'm not going for a lot of descriptions, so I can skate on a lot of this stuff. But if you're narrative, narrative driven, you may want to be there and take some pictures. Um, you always write a draft plan. Okay, I think we got that. Am I missing anything? Um, I'm whizzing through over here to see what I'm... Oh, somebody's, somebody liked the movie. <laughs> um, you've written so many books. And... Okay, I think I've caught up here. Let me know if I missed anything. Susan, I'm... I'm it's, it's been... You know, it's always great to get together with other writers, so I'm... Thanks, thanks so much for having me and for inviting me. And I wish everybody the best. And like I said, there's one takeaway. There's just no rule. Um, there's no rules. So don't anybody tell you there are. Uh, this was, a, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, I'm sorry about the tech screw ups on this side, but um, thank you for having me. And thanks for staying, staying with me through it all, so. It's Good always night. so lovely to have some of your experience. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you. And I came from Australia oh. to watch it, so there you go. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Nice to see you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> oh, I wish you all the, all the best with your writing. <laughs>